I'm Phil DiPietro. I am a project manager at the National Energy Technology Laboratory, and I'm here with Velo Kuskra. Velo is the author of the NETL report, Improving Domestic Energy Security and Reducing Greenhouse Gas Emissions with Next Generation Carbon Dioxide Enhanced Low Recovery. So, good morning, Velo. Good morning, Phil. Um, the uh, study that uh, you did that in 2011 um, is often cited. It puts forth a uh, economically recoverable resource estimate for CO2 enhanced oil recovery of 24 billion barrels of crude oil, increasing to 60 billion barrels under a uh, next generation scenario. So that's a lot of crude oil that could be could be had. And uh, recently, you and Matt Wallace have done a new report, uh, a, a closer in-depth look at next generation CO2 EOR. And um, I think we want to talk about that today and tell people about it so that we can uh, make this information more accessible. So, uh, could you, in this new study, you have broken the concept of next generation CO2 EOR into five components. So could you describe those five components? Sure, love to do it. Um, we started out by looking at what are the constraints to higher recovery using CO2 enhanced oil recovery. And we identified five. And then we built the next generation technology components to address each of these constraints or barriers. Uh, so the first technology, which is conformance, uh, works to reduce the amount of uh, bypassing of CO2 through a reservoir, it, it really addresses heterogeneity. That's one of the major uh, geological constraints to higher oil recovery. Uh, next, we looked at advanced design of uh, CO2 enhanced oil recovery patterns and flooding strategies. And the whole uh, goal of that is to identify where the remaining mobile oil is left in the reservoir and design your wells and patterns to contact that oil. Third, uh, the CO2 is a much more mobile, let's call it less viscous type of a fluid than the oil. So it tends to run through or technically finger through the oil um, and therefore bypasses again some of the oil that's left in the reservoir, and we looked at the concept of improved mobility control by applying subtypes of thickeners or viscosity enhancers. <clears throat> and fourth, uh, we recognized that once you're able to contact more of the reservoir, it becomes productive to use more CO2. Uh, and we looked at ways that you could inject more CO2 without it just channeling through a thief stone and, and not being productive. And finally, we looked at a class of reservoirs that cannot be raised to high enough pressure for the uh, CO2 to become miscible with the oil. And uh, looked at a new technology that's being studied in a laboratory at University of Kansas called near miscible CO2 and began to apply that technology to those, that remaining class of reservoirs. Okay, so that's breaking it into <coughs> its components. And um, so how did you do the work? How did you, how did you break it into the components? How did you compare the different types of things you could do? Sure. What, what we looked at was the physics involved in each of these technologies. And then we took understanding of that physics and the effect that it has on the flows through the reservoir and programmed that into our uh, finite difference stream tube reservoir simulator called Profit. Uh, and we uh, captured the effects of the physics for each of these five technologies within that model and then applied that to the very large data set of U.S. oil reservoirs. Okay, so you looked at each one individually. <coughs> yes, we did. And then kind of compared the effects exactly. of each one individually and then you looked at the overall effect. So um, what did you learn? Are there, are, is one more important? Than, how, 
What's the relative impact of the sure. different types of things you could do? Well, surprisingly, but I guess once you think about it, uh, it becomes clearer. It's really the combined application of these technologies that provided the highest impact. And you can imagine that if you, the various earlier technologies allow a reservoir to be contacted more efficiently, then applying more CO2 has a very productive effect. Um, and we also found that different technologies have different impacts uh, across the country. For example, in the Williston Basin, an area with highly fractured reservoirs, conformance becomes a very important issue. And along the Gulf Coast, where you have good reservoir contact, uh, using more CO2 or mobility control becomes the most favorable technology. So one way to think about it is, you know, there are horses for courses. Okay. Okay. Did the, um, one thing I'm curious about is you, you broke, you, you were looking at the next generation as a bundle in the previous yes. study, and now you've broken it out. And through the act of, of segregating the different components, did, did you learn anything about the art of modeling or characterizing uh, next CO2 enhanced oil recovery? I think it was actually a wonderful exercise in that we, by breaking out the, this, uh, batch of next generation technologies, uh, we really were able to better understand the physics of flow and the mechanisms that ena would enable this next generation technology to be applied well. <clears throat> and then with that understanding, to be able to um, program that into the model uh, to really capture that effect. I think that was our, our our number one finding. As part of that, we also learned that there are some other mechanisms that are important to capture, uh, particularly if we were doing conformance, which attempts to address reservoir heterogeneity, we needed to have a much stronger way to capture heterogeneity. And we went back to some work by Dr. Hirosaki at Rice, where he was, he put out a, a method by which to use past data to get a much stronger measure of heterogeneity. It's called the Dijkstra-Parsons coefficient in a reservoir, and that way we could really capture the effect of, uh, let's say, conformance control on each specific reservoir. Okay. Um, I think that kind of gets to my last question, and that is uh, alert readers. Uh, we'll notice that um, mm -hmm. there's been a little bit of change going from the 2011 report to this current um, effort. Uh, the economically recoverable resources for the current technology has gone down a little bit from 24 billion barrels to 20, and, and the gap between current and, and next generation is a little bit bigger, so that next generation is still around 60. So um, I, I guess the improved uh, characterization of heterogeneity is one aspect. Are there any other refinements that you've made through this process that are, are driving those uh, differences? One of the other effects that previously was difficult to capture was the loss of CO2 once you inject in reservoir. And loss is probably not such a great word for it, but it's CO2 that would go into solution in the waters of the reservoir, that stays behind, that's captured in the pore space or in the residual oil that you haven't uh, recovered. And so we added some features and that raised the CO2 requirements and moved some oil fields that were previously economic, made them somewhat less economic, made them more marginal. And so that was one. And I talked about the improving the heterogeneity and that's such an important part. And it began to identify certain parts of the country where that was a more dominant effect and had a bigger uh, constraint on oil recovery than we had assumed in the past. I think those two are the two primary differences. And, you know, as you go and dig into the data, you always kind of find a few things that you want to fix. Right, right. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, it was fun doing that, and uh, we hope that uh, 
as a reader goes through the report that they can begin to gain some insights for their own fields as well. The new report, an in-depth look at carbon dioxide enhanced soil recovery, is available on the NETL website.